Wednesday, February 5th to order. Uh, first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Yes, that carries. Thank you. We've got two delegations this evening. The first delegation is Rachel Blaney. So Rachel, if you'd like to come up to the podium, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much for having us here to visit you. And I will try to take a few minutes. And at any point, please interrupt and ask questions. So I'm here from the Immigrant Welcome Center. I'm Rachel Blaney. I'm the Executive Director. I'm here with Vienna Young, who's our project manager for this particular activity. And we just wanted to give you a bit of an update on our Welcoming Communities project. Just to reorient people about what we do, our vision statement is a North Island region that embraces diversity and inclusivity while actively engaging with the vibrant cultures in the region. Our newcomers feel safe, uh, welcome, and respected. So as you know, we provide services. We have clients all the way from Bowser to Port Hardy, Santula. Uh, it's kind of amazing where people are coming from all around the world, and they love it here. So our Welcoming Communities project has been a project that we've been doing for the past year and a half, and it will be wrapping up in March. Uh, the rationale was that immigrants are a vital part of our communities, and we wanted to showcase that. The goal is to help immigrants, community members, and service providers to overcome cultural and language barriers, and we've had some mis tremendous success there. We're very excited. And the outcome is that immigrants can successfully settle and contribute to our communities, which is a priority for all levels of government. So we've done a couple of roundtables and had some great uh, participation and really appreciate everybody who's come out. Um, when we talked to the roundtables, we asked them, what do you feel are priorities within this region? And what they identified was there is a, ne a need for a diversity training. So what they really wanted to talk about was just looking at how many diverse cultures are coming into the community and are we doing our best and are we supporting each other in the best way possible. The other thing that they felt was a priority was understanding the benefits of mentorship program. So it was really interesting as we brought the round table together, we had immigrants come and talk about their uh, stories and how they came to the Comox Valley, uh, what their experiences were here, and one of the needs that they identified was mentorship, just some support to understand how things work in Canada. And I just want to be clear, that's not always people who don't speak English. We've had a lot of people from English-speaking countries also feel like they just don't know how to get into certain areas of the community and wanted to do a better job, and mentorship is a great way of doing that. So. The community really told us that mentorship was important, and so we've done some work in that area for sure. So a lot of the activities has led us to a global fusion fest. So one of the things we heard at every, uh, well I hear it everywhere, is where is everybody coming from? How many cultures do we have represented in our communities? Um, and what's going on and we want to know more. So we've come together with uh, an advisory committee, uh, and we've created an event that will be happening on March 8th. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 10 to 4. Uh, and we're really excited to have everybody. So this is your official invitation. We'll be doing it at a lot of marketing. We encourage you all to come out and attend. The objectives are to share culture, foster understanding, and connect community members and newcomers. Uh, so the format is it's free for all participants, vendors, and exhibitors. And we're really impressed uh, by how many people are coming forward. I think we have about six restaurants so far. Am I wrong? Yeah, about six or more restaurants that are coming to showcase their cultural cuisine. In terms of cultural performances, again, we're seeing a lot of people come out uh, from the community, some groups that we haven't even identified that are really excited to share some of their culture. So we'll have ethnic food tasting. That will cost you a little bit of money. We can't ask people to do things for free in that sort of numbers, but we're excited to do that. There will also be some traditional crafts and workshops, so if you want to learn more, it's going to be the place to be. So it's at the Florence Philbrook Center, and we hope to see you there. And the second part of my little report back to you is just to let you know how we're doing and what kind of service or supports that we're seeing, um, and some of the changes that we're going to be facing in the next while. So for those of you who don't know, uh, almost two years ago the federal government uh, made a, st uh, a statement that they would be reclaiming our services from the provincial government to the federal government. So we are right now going through a process of changing funders. Part of the change that's going to have the biggest impact on the community 
is right now under the provincial government, we're allowed to serve naturalized citizens. For those of you who don't know what a naturalized citizen is, is that just means somebody who was born in another country and has moved here and has uh, now become a citizen. So currently we're allowed to support uh, naturalized citizens. Just so you know, some of the services that we provide are uh, people retiring. So we see quite a few people are coming through our doors now. They've been in Canada for 30, 40 years. And they're doing all their retirement stuff and they find out that they need some particular paperwork because they weren't born in Canada. And they don't always have the right information. And so we support them in getting that information um, and helping them present themselves. Uh, also, we deal with people who are aging population that um, have not, they don't have strong English skills. And so as they get older, they're facing some health issues, so they need our support in terms of interpretation to make sure that they get the best care they possibly can receive. So as you can see, we've served over 500 uh, new clients in the last six months. 423 of those clients are considered eligible clients to the provincial government. Um, so that number is going to go down by 149 clients next year. So that's how many people will be cut out of the services that we currently uh, provide. So again, uh, we did do a recent survey with our naturalized citizens. So there are two other categories, I just want to clarify, that will no longer be eligible for services. One of them are people who have applied for refugee status but have not been accepted. And people who have been nominated by the province to become uh, permanent residents but have not received, so that's done provincially, but they haven't received their letter from the federal government confirming that. So those uh, folks we see a little bit, but not as often by far as naturalized citizens. 100% of the clients that we talked to identified language as a barrier in their lives. Um, and those were some people that felt that they did have a fairly good comprehension of the English language. So again, that just points back to that idea that if you're dealing with health issues and you have fairly good English, you operate fairly well, when you come to that, some of that health talk, it can be a little bit complex. Um, the top three services that they use are language services, assistance with medical issues, and assistance filling out forms. Uh, and some of their barriers uh, to learning English is they're working. So finding time to go take an English class during the day when you've got a full-time job can be a bit of a barrier. Uh, transportation for some folks, and some people just didn't understand when the services were available. So thank you so much for your time. We're always here for any questions that you have. Uh, we're really excited to see uh, at our event, we've already got about 20 different cultures that are going to be represented, so there's a lot of diversity here and we're really excited to show it. Thanks, Rachel. Does any members of council have any questions for Thank you very much for your presentation. Up to good work. <coughs> the uh, next delegation we have is Jordan Felder, Karen Cummings, and Teresa Colby. And I actually have a conflict in that I'm the executrix of the Lake Centre. Okay. I have property, two properties. All right. For doing it. All right.
Washington, that's uh, labeled A on the map, and Gladstone and Comox labeled B on the map. Um, that's the development site. So those are the two current uh, most frequently used intersections for everyone living in the neighborhood. Uh, first, let's review the already dangerous scenarios at this intersection, Comox and Gladstone. Um, the Avenue restaurant patrons, patrons take up the street with the horizontal parking. Turning east or west onto Comox, you have to get around the parked cars, putting you across the center line, interfering with anyone trying to turn onto Gladstone. Turning east onto Comox Ave from Gladstone is nearly impossible as there's a constant flow of traffic. Uh, here's a photo um, just illustrating typical midday parking at the Avenue. You can see how difficult it is. Uh, you do have to cross the center line. Here's the vehicle preparing to turn onto Comox. You can see the truck is in the wrong lane. This is unavoidable. Here's an example of busy parking at the Avenue restaurant. Anyone can see the dangerous situation at this intersection. Why would we want to add more traffic volume to an already congested intersection if not necessary? Uh, here's an example of commercial parking. You see the two trucks, uh, again, really taking up that street. Uh, it's not uncommon, and one would think it should be mentioned in the traffic study. Um, some congestion here on Comox Ave. Um, this is uh, taken right from the traffic study. The level of service, LOS, um, A being the best and E being the worst. Um, this highlights the Wallace access. Um, as you can see on the right hand side of that box, the level of service um, by 2034 is E, which is the worst case scenario. So that's using Wallace access. Uh, the Anderton access with the combined traffic actually illustrates that um, there's going to be less traffic at um, all the intersections um, related to that if they do use Anderton access. Uh, let's look at the intersection of Cook and Anderton, so the other uh, frequented uh, intersection. This will be the other intersection residents of the new development would use primarily if Wallace access is permitted. There's severe visibility issues with this intersection as shown in the pictures of the next slide. As you approach Anderton from Cook, the large hedge blocks your vision from both corner properties. Vision's impaired looking north and south until you get right up to the sidewalk, at which point your vantage is impaired on the right by the telephone pole that sits in the sidewalk. On the north side of the intersection, the sidewalk extends out into the lane which makes the turning radius of cars entering Cook from Anderton very limited. Um, seems to be a missed slide there, but I'll get to it. The only apparent reason Wallace has been chosen as access is because of typical engineering practice. Uh, there's too many idiosyncrasies of these two intersections to resort to typical engineering practices. The poor conditions of these intersections should be properly, properly evaluated prior to deciding to add more traffic volume. The traffic study, in our opinion, indicates that Anderton would be the preferred access point. Um, so turning onto Gladstone off Comox Ave, Easttown. Cars turning onto, Comac, onto Gladstone creates dangerous situations for cyclists. Combine the high commercial volume of this corner with the on-street parking at a very dangerous intersection. To propose an increase of potentially 45 additional vehicles during peak hours seems very, very unwise. None of these situations will worsen if the Anderton access is chosen. So here's back to the Anderton and Cook intersection. Um, so you have to come out past the stop sign, and when you do get past the stop sign, um, you're right on Anderton, and this is your view. That pole is, is really hazardous, it's really in the way. Uh, this is looking at that same intersection. Uh, note the tight radius. Uh, for the car turning right onto Cook, the, the car turning onto, onto Anderton has to be out this far because of the pole and the hedges, so it's just a very dangerous situation. I uh, know the truck is in the other lane, this is common because of the sidewalk's angle that intrudes onto Cook, actually makes Cook a very narrow entrance. So here I've highlighted um, the potential location for an access uh, via Anderton from the 335 Anderton development. Um, here's looking south on Anderton from Cook, and the 335 Anderton's on the right. Note how much room there is, how easy it would be to have access onto Anderton with no traffic interruption. 
is one possible example of what a functional access could look like. Um, as you see, North up Anderton, South down Comox, um, the divider entrance and ingress to the development in the east is right there, and the pedestrian control across one would be a ideally situated pedestrian flow and safety. Um, but my next point addresses the obvious flaw in the pedestrian flow that the city plan has laid out in the proposed neighborhood pedestrian corridor. Once the pedestrian flow reaches Anderton, the arrows then detour up Cook and then back down three blocks along Anderton to Vita Vista. This would be a popular spot for jaywalking and other accidents waiting to happen. This illustration shows the pedestrian flow from Rodella through the walls. So the green arrows here are uh, indicating pedestrian flow that come down through Comox Hill, uh, down Wallace Ave, and through the Anderton property where they get to Anderton Street, um, where there's no potential location for a crosswalk. Um, the detour up would really, you know, it would promote people to jaywalk there. Um, a new crosswalk could be located right where I've indicated on the chart there. Currently, there's no crosswalks from Cook all the way down to Comox. It makes logical sense that development would warrant a crosswalk midway. Having controlled crosswalk here would be the logical solution given the flow of traffic. This would also allow natural brakes and traffic for vehicles from the development to enter onto Anderton. By creating an access point on Anderton for the development, it will enhance the traffic flow of vehicles, cyclists and pedestrians, while naturally slowing down the Anderton traffic to a safer speed at the same time, leaving Walls Ave as a dead end road with a sidewalk for pedestrians and cyclists. Cars that um, have had to detour three blocks around Cook could make a safe turn with better access and improved visibility aided by the use of controlled sidewalk if the energy access is approved. So potential for new home buyers, uh, just consider your potential buyer at the 355 Anderton development. Would you prefer a direct easy access to Anderton with pedestrian controlled crosswalk and sidewalk accessing walls? Or the current plan that creates or that requires traveling three extra blocks every time you come and go to an unsafe, substandard, uncontrolled intersection where you must queue up with other cars from the neighborhood. The answer seems pretty clear to us. Access via Anderton is much more appealing. In conclusion, we request the council for consideration to include a safe access point on Anderton to the new subdivision with pedestrian controlled crosswalk on Anderton. We accept the subdivision's eventuality. We do not accept the traffic consequences of this plan. Please study and implement an, an, an Anderton access to the 355 Anderton subdivision. Thanks for your time and consideration. We ask that you reconsider the options for this development and give it access on the end and not the walls. Please not compromise the safety of the neighborhood we love for the sake of the substandard traffic flow. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. <coughs> Is, does anybody on council have any questions of Mr. Connor? Thank you very much for your presentation. It would uh, probably be helpful to council if we were to have the uh, next council meeting if we were to have the traffic engineer come and uh, present his findings. Do you want a motion with that? I, uh, yes, I'll think. make that motion. Yeah. I'll second that. Councilor Fletcher? And so on that, um, this um, presentation would be considered by the, uh, the consultant? Well, I would hope staff would send him a copy of this presentation okay. before he comes and makes yeah. his presentation. And mm -hmm. It would be helpful yeah. if council brought their presentations along, too. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's requested. Yeah. Yeah. All in favor of that motion? Opposed? That carries. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along, we've got the minutes of the regular council meeting of January 15th. Uh, I'll move, I'll move, uh, Second. Second. All in favor? Oh. I guess maybe for sure. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion on the table to approve the regular council meeting of January 15th. Move. Okay, we've already moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we have the committee of the whole meeting. Uh, I just had one, it was just one question. Um, I'm not sure if it's 
Um, on page 20, uh, where it says, I, I actually uh, signed the Aboriginal Education Agreement, I in fact um, was there to witness it rather than oh. sign it. I was at the signing rather than signing it. So the uh, committee of the whole meeting, <coughs> pardon me, of January 22nd to receive please. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? That carries. We do this a little differently at the regional districts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is some committee recommendations. Uh, the first one is with regards to dog, dog license and, dog, and pound bylaw. Bylaw 1765, the first, second, and third read. Mm -hmm. Second. I, I think. Yeah, we moved it twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Sort of throwing off. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to be that carries. Yeah. Uh, we've got the uh, draft financial plan for receipt. So um, moved. Receipt. Seconded. Oh, Seconded. Okay. Yeah, I just had one uh, thing. In light of the fact that uh, UBCM has concluded their gas tax funding consultations and there's going to be new uses for gas tax. Um, when I look at what's been going on with our water meter money that's in there, the $25,000 per year, and next to nobody has signed up for it, I'd like to take that money, put it into a fund aside for uh, to help with our downtown revitalization. We're going to need uh, signs, we're going to need some connectivity coming up the roads, so a $50,000 piece to help out with that I think would be something that would be more in fitting with what the public would be wanting us to use that money for. If it can't be used for that when the new money comes out, then we could relook at it at that time. So I would make that motion. Do we have a second here? I'll speak at once. <laughs> well, that I'll second the motion. Is that appropriate? You can second the yeah. motion. I'll second the motion. I should also tell Council that I had a discussion with uh, our CAO and he said that their connection program with regards to water meters would be unaffected if we did move that $50,000 out of the financial plan. Am I correct in saying that? Well, we would still continue with the program as, as it's operating right. uh, for, for anybody that um, an existing home that has a water service break when we go in to replace that water service, we upgrade the infrastructure to the new standard, which is a meter setter and a meter. With the new subdivision being developed, when we accept that, the standards for, for that are that meters are put in place with that development. Secondary suites require meters. So all these, all these functions still continue. Yeah. Um, so the $25,000 helps offset some of the costs that are applied in the water fund, but you're, you're correct. I did say that, and the, the program will, will continue. And, and I noticed that on Beaufort, uh, you put water meters in there. Is that in light of the sidewalk coming? Was that a piece of that, or why did that? Why did those yes. guys get meters? Yes, we're, yeah. we're that, uh, that portion of, of road will be getting upgraded later this year, and uh, that is part of, mm -hmm. part of the program. If we go in to do a road, and we need to upgrade the water service. We're not going to go in later. We're going to do that work gotcha. at the same time we're in advance of the asphalt coming down. Yes, and, and just to clarify, it, it, it's 25, not 50. 25,000 this year, 25,000 okay. next year. And okay, the okay, the, okay we, yeah. this, uh, we are asking for uh, you know, receipt of the first draft of the 2014 okay. to 18. So you were taking yeah. each. Um, yeah the annual contribution of 25,000. Right. This year and next year. Yes, um, I won't be supporting it. Um, we have got a million in the budget for the marina and um, uh, beautification and the marina park and, and, uh, and that area. So I'm just wondering whether by adding 25,000 over the next few years to that, whether that is really um, uh, warranted. And um, 
and it seems to be a little bit splitting hairs, a lot of things that we do flesh out in the, uh, in the planning, which quite rightly we don't have to name which roads we're going to be doing, we can say it's coming out of this fund. So I think it's important for people to know that that money is there. I think there's still stratas that need to be metered. And, um, you know, if it's not spent, that's great. But I, I don't see, if we're still going to spend it, why we would have it, not have it in the budget. So I will be leaving it there. Councillor Grant? Well, I guess in, to, to uh, speak to that, uh, you know, our number one goal three years ago was to get some more vi vitality on our main street. We've had consultants come into our park and tell us what we need to do. One of the issues that we have there is connectivity to our park and signage to get there, which isn't all going to be covered by the money that we put aside. Um, I also think that during last campaign, I think we all heard a thousand times they want our downtown to get more vital. And I think that it's time that we put a little bit of stock into that and said, we're here to help out. We can consult with the BIA, find out what it is that would be the most important thing for them, and, and get in the game with them. I think after three years, it's time we did that. Councillor Fletcher. Um, well, I, I think we certainly are um, addressing the, the downtown issue and the revitalization and the vitalization. Um, the ICT grant is extremely significant, and we've, um, we've dedicated ourselves to applying to that fund. Um, and uh, that's significant. I would rather see the, the monies remain in the water meter fund and have it um, supplement um, the public works as necessary. Signs, you know, I'm not even sure what the signs are at this time, so um, I'm sure if we go down the road and have the ICT grant accepted, I'm sure if there's really a great sign that needs to be done, we could find some monies down the road. I think we're in a good position where we are. Councillor McKinnon, thank you, Your Worship, or Your Worship. <laughs> uh, thank you for clarifying that the, the uh, water meter program uh, is directing that for their sale, that it, that it would continue anyway. Uh, the the money is for the $25,000. Is it essential that we need that money for signs right now? I'm not so sure. And I'm pleased to hear that there's still going to be the opportunity to go ahead for people to opt to use the water meters. Um, however, I'm not sold that, that we need the $25,000 right now for signage for the downtown thing, although I'm all supportive of the revitalization of the downtown core, but I don't think we need the money instantly right now. So I'd say leave it where it is right now. If there's a need, we can look for it elsewhere. <coughs> is everybody finished? Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to disagree with you on that point because if you were to talk to any of the downtown merchants in, in the town of Comox, anything we can do to help them along with their problems is going to be well uh, thought of and, and well needed. We've spent almost a million and a half dollars of gas tax money on water meters, and we've got about a hundred people who are uh, who are actually taking advantage of the program. Uh, if there's one place I can see where there is no sense of urgency to pump another $50,000 into, it's the water meter program. And that's uh, borne out by the residents who are actually uh, uh, <clears throat> going to be using them. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a million dollars in the financial plan, but a lot of that is dependent upon getting the ICT grant and getting a Western Diversification grant. None of that money is certain. And I think we've got 225 or 250,000 of our own money. To, to this point, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, uh, campaigned on this idea of downtown revitalization. And to date, I don't think we've put five cents into downtown revitalization. And uh, the motion before us right now is for a paltry $50,000 to help those merchants in the downtown. And, uh, I think it would be a good sign by this council to show them that we're interested and that we're going to put some money towards it. So that's. Uh... Yeah, and, and I would certainly have to agree with you. We are all, I would speak, certainly for myself, and I would think the sentiment is expressed by everyone. We really do care about our downtown, and that's why we have been working on a project that is to revitalize the downtown. And uh, as has been mentioned, 
You're quite right. Uh, we are looking for grants for that money, but we are looking at a million dollars. So to say that we aren't doing anything, I, I kind of, you know, take exception at that. And, uh, and part of the project, as I understood it, was, you know, signage came out very strongly at the meetings I attended, the need for signage. So I certainly saw that that would be part of it, how you, you bring people to the downtown, you can connect in your waterfront and, and all the, the wonderful um, amenities that Comox has. And I certainly think that we're all there for, to, to promote it. So I, I would just like the business community, if they are getting, you know, not to get that wrong impression. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor McKinney? Is it premature to, uh, to have this discussion of moving those funds when we don't know yet whether we've got the grant? Uh, the timeline for the grant, is there a, a guesstimate as to when that, uh, that uh, we'll get a word on whether we, we will be receiving the grant? Well, we'll hear from her about round one later this month, but that's only round one. We'll probably have this budget passed by the time we know if there's any money coming. Correct. So, no, the answer to your question would be no, it's not premature. And, you know, when I say signage, I, um, that's just one issue that the downtown merchants see as a, as a something that we need to, to get a little more business in. They, they would have a list of things, and, and if we were to go back to them and say, hey, there's some money here that we could look at using for some of these things, they could come up with a litany of other things. So don't just think of signage. One of the big deals is the hill that you have to go up to get from the park to the, to the top of the street up here. And it requires, I've seen in some places where they've used artwork, to, uh, stopping points, resting areas, benches. There's all sorts of things that could be done to improve that piece to get people up the street. And, you know, Tom's absolutely right. Our business people on our downtown street are really, really hurting. And their perception is, it's great that we're doing this, but it's been three years. What's going on? That's the perception out there. So whether or not there's things going on behind the scenes is kind of irrelevant if you're trying to keep your doors open every day. So, you know, if we could, this to me is a sign of good faith and it shows that we're really in the game, that we're trying hard, and that we're going to do some constructive things to help them out along the way. So to me, it uh, makes a heck of a lot more sense than putting that money into a water meter program that people clearly are not taking us up on. Okay, so on the amendment, all in favor? Opposed? The motion's defeated. So uh, on, re on receipt of the uh, financial plan, all in favor? Opposed? I still want the financial one. I still want it the way it is. <laughs> no, no, no. At this stage, though, you're just receiving That's right. the yeah. document. Yeah. And you're, uh, we're going to bring you back, uh, not next week's committee, but all the following committee, all the, uh, the capital plan and the operating plan for the council of mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next, we've got. Uh, Gary Cleave, the Dare Society, Dare BC Society request for funding. And it was, uh, it was a recommendation to refer it to the uh, budget meeting. Tell them of that. Okay. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Opposed? That carries. There's no committee reports. Uh, we've got the uh, management report dated February 5th. Move receipt. Move receipt. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Opposed? That carries. Uh, special reports. We've got the, the Comox Valley Regional District minutes for receipt. Move receipt. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? That carries. Uh, we've got the uh, Regional uh, Solid Waste Board meeting minutes for receipt. Move receipt. Second. All in favor? And also the hospital board meeting. Move. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Bylaws. We've got bylaw 1765, the Comox Dog License and Pound Bylaw Amendment, number one. Move first, second, and third reading. Second. 
Is there any discussion on that? All in favor? Opposed? That carries. <laughs> New business. We've got the rezoning 14.2 zoning bylaw amendment development permit 14.2 related DPA number seven riparian areas and etc. And I believe <laughs> Marvin has a. I'm hurrying through that to turn it over to Mark. So he does have a presentation on this.
So we took a look and said, well, what was the next option? And we really looked at the, the, the objectives of the Greenway, the objectives of, of the environmental um, conservation, and the idea of minimal intrusion into the neighborhood. So the first thing we looked at is what, what can we do in terms of taking away some of the unknowns, i.e. the building area for both lots, and at the same time maintaining the existing zone, the existing R1.1 zone, which does allow park. So we wouldn't have to rezone for that. What we came up with is, okay, this lot, we rationalize this lot by changing the, the lot boundary, pushing it to account for the existing patio and the existing right. Um, and uh, existing parcel size, we've seen the 650 square meter minimum. You can get a 650 square meter minimum parcel size here, with sufficient width for a, a decent house in, in this area. But we get this quite unique parcel size. And because of the environmental sensitivities, essentially, by triggering a subdivision to rationalize the two building lots, we also then trigger the environmental protection under the bar. So we have to identify what is the sensitive areas and any in, in, uh, intrusion into those sensitive areas, we then have to provide uh, mitigation or compensation. So the, if the width in here, and to keep our 650 square meter minimum parcel area, this area will still be environmentally sensitive, but we put a covenant on it saying essentially, this property owner, congratulations, you own it, but you can't build on it. You gotta maintain it as trees. So it, it's kind of a um, baby switch. You own it, but you can't do anything on it. At the same time, it means for the town and, and any kind of park in here, if you don't want any intrusion or you're worried of any intrusion coming in from the proposed park public lands, then it's probably a wreck defense of some type. And this is also in terms of wildlife corridor movement. So we start having a restriction on that. And I took a look at the next item and said, well, okay, what can we do in terms of fixing that to create um, buildable lots where it's clear where you can build, what property is yours, the property that you do have, you can actually use, um, and still not do anything sort of radical in terms of zoning or changes. Came up with this, which is option three, which is the proposed option. So in this case, um, what we're proposing to do is, again, take lot A, account for the existing driveway and patio, and probably this soften off this lot right in here. So we have a very usable lot here, recognizing the existing structure. We want to increase, uh, sorry, decrease the width here of lot A. That gives us a better access way into the park plan, and also in terms of just environmental, the environmentally sensitive areas in this south area. We then take this area that was proposed under option two to have a covenant that you couldn't build on, put it in the park, so we'll be able to maintain control of that. And then reduce this down to 450 square meters, R2.1 zoning, which will be the effective area of option two anyways, which was keeping the R1.1, and you have 650 square meters, but you can only realistically use 450. In terms of the actual details on the uh, sensitive areas and how that works under this proposal, what happened under this proposal. The sensitive areas, so we, we did um, hire a um, qualified environmental protection, uh, qualified environmental professional under the law regulations. They identified a sensitive area on this line and then following this line without any alterations or anything else. So under this proposal, subdivision would go ahead to get a development permit. Um, Queen has identified that it would be acceptable to alter this such that we would add this area in for sensitive uh, protection, this area in here, and that gives us the clear building area at this point. So we're compensating for it. Also, what we would then propose is it's heavily um, the environmental values of this area are compromised by um, uh, non-native or invasive species. And so we would then, in, in, um, as part of the park, in terms of introducing a, a uh, retrofit plan for that vegetation to bring it into natural vegetation, mm -hmm. increase the ecological value, uh, value in the area. To do that, we require uh, a number of applications 
rezoning so that we could rezone lot B to 3.2. Um, development variance permit to reduce the parcel from the current 15 meters to the 8 meters. And the development variance permit to allow the subdivision under under Roar, which is the other stuff, and have the environmental file. That's it? Yep. Thank you. Is there any questions of uh, Marvin while we have left? Okay. Um, so Marvin, I'm not pleased. Um has that jig jog. It seems kind of awkward to ask an owner to have it, but is it necessary in order to... No, we don't anticipate any any problems fine-tuning the plan, getting quick approval to have this come down. Okay, so you can smooth that more. out? And, yes. Oh, okay. Better. Is this the recommended option you want to take to the public? Yes. Under the recommendation? Oh, it's the only one in color. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just clarifying it because there is a the recommendation is to take it to the public. Uh, Councillor Price? Yes. So would we fence or would there be no requirement to fence um, because the path will be um, away from the boundary lines? What we would do is if this um, met with council's approval, um, we would then put in some special uh, we could put in special specifications in terms of the fencing. Okay. So we rely heavily on Al in terms of where does it foresee a future one way one through? We wouldn't put a walkway through now because it's not being intended. But where does it go? Where does, where does it see that? And then is there sufficient buffer in those areas so that we can have a standard fence? And a standard fence, I think, is around a five and a half foot fence, a half foot fence. Great. And I'd, I'd just like to commend staff too for working on this. I think it's a really good approach to how we protect land and, and this in all likelihood will end up at no cost to the town. So I think, you know, that long-term planning that went into looking at where do we want to see these routes and the, uh, and coming to fruition, I think it's, uh, I think it's a really exciting project and, and, and I like what you put together and it's very creative. Thank you. We win. Thank you. We win. Thank you very much, Marvin. So there is a recommendation here. Yeah? Move the recommendation. Second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Uh, so uh, I guess staff will schedule an open house and we'll hear more about that in the future. Okay. Uh, the annual referrals to the school district be received for information purposes. Move. Second. Any discussion on that? Councilor Fletcher? comment that I think it's um, really interesting information and all my time on council I don't ever remember ever seeing um, this sort of discussion and conversation between the school district so I think it's really healthy and yeah, I appreciate it. So, yeah. Do you have something to say? Just a quick comment that it looks like it gives a timeline for the Colmox L property within the, they're anticipating within the next five years that uh, that will be put up for sale, or, or they'll they'll try to get, get rid of that property. So it gives us a timeline there as a, as a council to look at that as well. It's the information is appreciated. Okay, on receipt, all in favor? Opposed? That carries. We do have some correspondence from Al Gregory. Move the seat. Second. Is there any discussion on that? Councillor Fletcher. So just for the receipt, um, is it possible that the council could send a letter to, um, to tell us indicating um, the value in having a cell tower approved cell service in the area? I think they don't know. If you're going to send it to tell us, I guess you should send it to the other carriers as well. To no. all, oh, all three okay. carriers. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. And it's it, it, my understanding is that they are looking not only tell us, but the other companies are, are all looking for suitable sites to improve coverage in Colmarks. There are a few shadows. Yeah. Where the you don't one on the rec center would be good. Yeah. So, have they activated the one on Knight Road? They have. They have. They have. And there's still that dead spot around, Brook, or around yeah. Brooklyn School. So another another option they're looking at is, is potentially around our fire hall, rec center area, uh, maybe a little higher towards Guthrie Road. So 
to improve, uh, apparently that would improve the coverage as well. And I noticed today on the news this morning they've talked about new regulations for cell towers as well, so it's there's going to be a whole lot more public process and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole new process coming for it, so it's not going to be quite as simple possibly as it was to get cell towers. So. To, to just reverse Patty's question then, uh, uh, does anyone have any objections to sending a letter from council to the three uh, carriers? What, what have we got to lose by sending a letter? Is that the right place don't. to send it? Or is it? Yeah, I guess that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, Bell and Tellus are the same towers, don't they? Rogers. Okay, well, so we have a motion to send a letter. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? So we we'll staff can draft up a, a letter for that. Okay. Reports from members of council. Council Member Kinnan, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, I attended the Comox Valley Housing Task Force with a number of other councillors on January 23rd at the Courtney Fire Hall. Uh, on the, the last couple of weekends, I was in Maple Ridge, Merritt, and Kelowna, and I picked up some newspapers there to follow local politics, which I could share to fellow councillors. Uh, many of the issues are the same. Uh, there's also some interesting uh, uh, issues in their communities that you might be interested in. Uh, I attended the Vancouver Island Regional Library Board meeting in Nanaimo on January 30th, and uh, I have a list now of six nominees for the Town of Comox Youth Achievement Awards uh, and Leadership Awards, and I hopefully, uh, with the suggestion that we are able to present them at the next regular council meeting, with each councillor presenting uh, one of them, uh, if that suits the mayor and the rest of the council. That's my report, thank you. Councillor Price. And I also attended the affordable housing um, round table at the Courtney Fire Hall. It was, uh, it was actually very, I think uh, quite a lot was achieved from it. Um, I also attended the Comox Archives and Museum Society's monthly meeting. And uh, there was nearly 8,000 visitors to the museum in 2013 is about a 90% increase in attendance from when it was downstairs at the back of the property. Um, they are doing some really good projects. One is uh, they're pie piecing together the military flyover photos from 1968 so that uh, mm -hmm. when it's all put together, a volunteer is doing this, we'll actually have an aerial photograph of the Comox from 1968. And, um, there is going to be, uh, 2016 is uh, coming on the horizon, as it's the town's 70th anniversary, and it's also the anniversary of the 102nd Battalion, uh, when they left from for World War One from the, uh, from the uh, jetty here. So uh, the museum will be uh, starting to plan for celebrations of those two, two events. And uh, I did go to the Rob Road School uh, walkabout for the HASTE project, that's a school project that looks at how you get kids to school uh, without driving them. And, uh, and Rob Road's a good example because it is a French immersion, so it covers a kids from all over town. So basically, uh, in groups, we were looking at how do we move around through the town, and what impediments, and so although it's aimed at the school, it's also an overview that it's connecting us to downtown, it's connecting us to the marina, and uh, yeah, so I think it's going to be a very uh, good project. And uh, I also attended an Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities executive meeting and an ABICC teleconference. Can I ask you a question about uh, ABICC? There was a survey sent around for us to fill out from ABICC. And I'm not sure whether mine had a glitch in it, but was there just one question on that survey? Or did I not get it properly? Or do you, or do you I maybe will, I will check it. Okay, could you yeah, check? Because it, it yes. seemed odd that there was just one question, but, yeah. but maybe I didn't it get it correctly. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Since we last met, I attended regional solid waste and possible district meeting January 16th. We received those minutes on our agenda today. Um, also had a meeting with um, Councillor Grant and myself and staff to prepare for regional district financial planning. And on January 21st, we had an all-day financial planning session at the regional district. Boy, that's a good one. And I attended the committee of the whole on the 20th, and on the 23rd, I too attended the uh, housing forum session. Recap session. Um, on the 28th, I attended the meeting of the 
last Wednesday, I too attended the Active Transportation Forum at uh, Caldwell Road. Um, yeah, I was. Um, that was interesting to learn how many children actually attend that live in the immediate area that, that could or could walk. And um, I thought it was a really um, excellent uh, way of engaging so many community members. There was island. There was VHA reps there. There was school district. There was the town. RCMP neighbors, everyone working together as well as lots of dads. It's a well thought out process. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Yeah, I attended the uh, Winter Bites uh, thing that they had going down to Sims Park a couple of times and volunteered for uh, doing some things with skating and fire pits and the, the likes. <coughs> um, I also attended a BIA session where they had a sort of, we call them a blue sky session or an ideas session um, to try and find if there were some new directions we should be looking at. Uh, some of the issues that came out of that were, of course, business taxes they find to be uh, onerous, that, although we have made some steps to, to uh, reduce those, they're still problematic for some of our business owners. They talked about some facade improvements and, uh, and other things, so um, more to come on that. Uh, they will be getting together again and they've developed some new committees. Uh, one would be an advocacy committee that they could uh, come and make better relations with town and be able to get their ideas and stuff uh, together with town, so that will be coming. I also attended an economic development executive meeting with the consultant that's doing the review on the ECDEV service. And then we had a follow-up meeting after that with the executive as well. Uh, I also attended a developers meeting in which uh, David Allen from the city of Courtney uh, attended, and uh, Richard, you'll be getting you'll be getting the invite to the next one to see. Um, and really, it was a it was a positive meeting, but it was a place where uh, the development community kind of uh, told the city the issues that they're having. Um, it was it was quite positive. The town of Comox uh, came up several times and. Most of the comments about Comox were very positive in that we've made some changes, have been working, uh, you know, working along and the process is getting better. And, uh, you know, they're appreciating the fact that we're, we're working in that, in that vein. So, uh, Courtney, it seems a little farther to go than, than we do, but we're certainly going in the right direction as far as they're concerned. So, that's my report. Thank you. Well, this is going to sound a lot like Councillor Fletcher's report. <laughs> I, I did, uh, since we last met, I did attend the solid waste uh, management meeting and a hospital board meeting in Campbell River. I attended a staff financial planning meeting with Councillor Fletcher and, uh, and senior staff at Comox talking about uh, financing at the regional district. I attended uh, an all day or half day uh, uh, regional district financial planning meeting. Attended the Town of Comox Committee of the Whole meeting. I too was at the Comox Valley Housing Task Force uh, Roundtable with uh, many of you here. I chaired a Sewer Committee meeting. I was re-elected as the uh, Chair of the Water Committee meeting, so I chaired that meeting as well. Attended a Sports Committee, Sports Commission meeting, and a CBRD Board meeting. So that's what I've got up to. That's it. Uh, is there any, uh, there's no media question, or is there any media question? <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say there's no question. There will be no questions. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so with that, a uh, motion to exclude the public and go in camera would be in order. Move. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, we'll go in camera.